There may be a lot wrong with the BBC, but it would be tragic to get rid of it. And I think that um, we more or less all know that. And they are under a ferocious attack now from essentially the right um, at the present time. People um, ask things like, um, does the BBC, um, how does the BBC get its information? BBC, like any news organisation, gets its information from multiple sources. Um, the That's also been put to me that the massive proliferation of public relations in the last 20 years has also um, infiltrated the BBC, if you like. Well, none of this matters, actually. What matters is the final judgment that you as a producer make as to whether something is true or false. It's no defence if you put out something that's false. There's no defence to say, oh, well, someone else said it. Or a PR company gave saw it to me. They're the bad ones. No good. The BBC has an absolute duty to be politically impartial and a total responsibility to check and ensure that what it puts out on the airwaves is correct and they're happy to have it. It doesn't mean that they have to um, adopt, you know, for example, um, it doesn't mean that um, uh, people um, have to make comments. It's up to them. It doesn't mean that people have to live a certain way of life. Uh, gay people, um, youth and so on. No, 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 no it's, not, it's not relevant. What's relevant is, it's the only thing that's relevant, is that the BBC's job is to be, amongst other things, an impartial um, observer and commentator of the scene. And then once the BBC has decided that it will publish, then it becomes open to the laws of defamation um, because it can't shovel responsibility off elsewhere and say, oh, I saw it in the Times or I saw it, you know, um, on the back of a cornflakes bag. The BBC's responsibility, the BBC is paid for by the public and the BBC's responsibility is to ensure fairness, neutrality, um, and to hold government to account. It's not its business to say, well, I think that um, uh, the Conservative Party is the best party, so we'll get rid of all the rest. No. It's not good enough for them to say, well, we don't like the Labour Party, we'll get rid of them. No. It's not your job. Um, it's not your job either um, for the BBC to think that it's the government. There are times when they've behaved as though they think they were the government. Um, and uh, this was very noticeable um, during uh, the Second Gulf War, um, that, um, the, the Iraq War. The Iraq War. Um, there are lots of people uh, who um, hated it, disagreed with it. There were people who supported it. Um, the, that's all fine. It's all a matter for them. It is not the matter for the BBC to, um, to say, well, I don't think you should be saying anything in favour of one side or the other. And I think, it's, I think there was a time when I heard it said on the Today programme, of the Today programme, that they think that they are the government. Or, as I heard from somebody else, we bring down governments. It is not the business of the BBC to bring down governments. It's not the business of the BBC to govern. The business of the BBC ought to be kept very simple. And it is very simple. They get a large chunk of money from the Exchequer, paid for by us, for them to behave in a proper, fair way. Nothing else. In um, 1984, 30th of January 1984, I became embroiled 
in what became a notorious programme um, called Maggie's Militant Tendency. The programme um, set out to examine the findings of the Young Conservative Report into attempted extreme right-wing infiltration by racists and anti-Semites into the outer reaches of the Conservative Party. The programme was very hard-hitting, the programme was very well researched, um, and, um, but nonetheless you learn that the truth is the most dangerous thing uh, in life in lots of ways um, because a lot of people won't like the truth and you'll find people coming to attack you and the rest of it. But it's very important to hold on to the fact that if you're a, pu a public servant or a, um, uh, a public broadcaster, that it's very important to hold on to the fact that your job is to pursue the truth as you see it, make sure it's well really reasoned and put it out there. Magnusman Intensity um, wasn't intended um, to be a definitive piece of work, nor was the Young Conservative report. What we were both doing, and we worked very closely with the Young Conservatives, is we wanted to ask ourselves, here's this information, yes it's very damaging, we named a number of Conservative MPs, um, who um, the programme said were, were members of organisations whose aim was to infiltrate the Conservative Party. Now, the, um, in saying that, um, we, um, we, we were effectively um, doing, um, both doing the same thing really, which was that we filmed the report, the official Conservative report, going in on the 30th of January 1984, into Conservative Central Office, and we filmed the author of the report, Phil Pedley, delivering it to the Conservative Party. There were many, many people um, uh, at Cabinet level and beyond who egged us on and supported it and said um, that we should continue to do it. We, um, we also previewed it in the cutting rooms with several um, leading Conservative figures um, all of whom uh, were full of praise for the programme. Anyway, we worked enormously hard, enormously hard, in order to, um, uh, this was in 1978. Uh, was it? Huh? Hang on. So, no, it was 84. Do it again, 1984. 84, okay. All right, let me go, go again and get the chronology right. Okay, in 19... Uh, the Maggie's Little Tendency, um, depending on where you stand, is either a very famous programme or it's a very notorious programme. All I can tell you is what our intention was. We worked incredibly hard. I remember um, one or two people on the production team said to me, James, it is absolutely backbreaking." Because we had a young conservative report that concluded that the party had become the target of a number of racist, anti-Semitic groups. And we named those groups. Um, when um, uh, it came um, to air, it um, created an enormous storm. And um, uh, the right of the party, uh, extreme right of the party, um, became um, very active, shall we say, in trying to undermine the programme. Anyway, um, the, we assembled, what happened after the programme was a number of the evidence statements that we took um, from Conservatives disappeared. So our witnesses, our batch of witnesses, um, fell, which unnerved the Board of Governors. Um, we, um, in the run-up to the um, trial in January um, 86, um, the, um, 
there were various discussions went on between the Conservative Party in government and the BBC. And at different times, they thought and we thought um, we'd win or vice versa. The one thing I would like to put on the record about Maggie's Mill Intensity, which I think has been misunderstood, is this. Um, I had the highest possible regard for Margaret Thatcher. I thought she was a remarkable woman and a remarkable Prime Minister. One of the greatest Prime Ministers of the last hundred years. Our programme was not intended to attack her, not at all. Our programme was intended to pose a question. And that question was, uh, do you think that this issue, the activities of the three groups that we named, was something you're happy about and happy to just leave alone? Or do you want to praise it? Or do you want to take action against it? Again, it was not our job. We're not government. We're broadcasters. Now, um, the, um, and it's very important to know that because we worked immensely hard. It didn't make us right, but we worked immensely hard. We assembled a huge body of information. We assembled a huge body of official um, uh, documentation. But the point is this, is that um, it was not intended in any way, shape or form, to damage Margaret Thatcher. Um, it, it, what it was was to pose a question in a plural democracy, is this kind of activity and these kind of groups of the kind, of the calibre, that um, conservative government would want to be associated with? And that was no more, no less than that. I mean, right? Okay, my name is James Hogan, James Vincent John Hogan. I joined the BBC as a very, one of a very special breed, uh, graduate trainees, um, and it was fiercely contested. I remember when I was doing it, um, the process took six months. There were 2,000 people on the long shortlist, and I was very lucky to get in. The, um, you need luck when you've got that number of people to, to defeat, as it were, then you need luck. Now my background, my background, my parents came from Southern Ireland and they were wonderful, but Irish Catholic working class family, very hard working. Um, and I didn't go initially to Oxford, I did later on. I did my first degree at Lancaster University in political science. I went up in 1970 and then I did a Master of Letters um, working with a genius, um, Brian Wilson, at All Souls in Oxford. I left um, um, my research at Oxford, which I, I completed subsequently, but I left um, to go into the BBC because I'd been offered this job and the job was like gold dust. Um, and so, uh, so there it is. So I joined in 1978. 1978, as it turned out, was to be a momentous year in British politics. I had said from the beginning, when I joined the BBC, that I wanted to concentrate on British politics, um, which I did. In 1978, 1978 was the winter of discontent. James Callaghan um, was um, dragged down by um, the, um, the trade unions um, who uh, told him that they were on his side. Um, my name is James Hogan, James Vincent Hogan. I um, joined the BBC in 1978 as a very special breed called um, uh, Research Assistant Trainees, RATS. There were 2,000 people um, lined up um, to, um, onto the long shortlist um, and a six-month selection process in which we were security vetted um, and in which um, the, um, uh, the, there were three, four 
um, sets of interviews over the six month period. I remember when the letter arrived at my uh, doorstep, um, I, I knew immediately that I got in because it was very soon after my final interview, whereas others got theirs a lot later. <coughs> anyway, so, um, what's wrong? I joined the BBC in 1978 as a research assistant trainee, a rat as we were all called. Um, it was highly competitive getting in 2000 on the long shortlist. Anyway, with the love of God and a big dollop of luck, I got in. Now, 1978, Margaret Thatcher had become leader of the Conservative Party by this time. James Callaghan had lost control of his party. Uh, ultimately, Callaghan was defeated on the floor of the House of Commons the following year, in February 1979. He was trying to get through wage control. The um, rule, the absolute iron rule in constitutional law in this country is that if a Prime Minister is defeated on a major plank of policy on the floor of the House of Commons, he must resign. This will be interesting to see whether that still holds with Boris Johnson if he's found guilty uh, um, uh, on the restrictions for Covid. Anyway, I, uh, I was in um, situ in 1979. I made programmes uh, almost entirely um, that were to do with politics um, and most notably British politics. Um, I covered the rise of Margaret Thatcher, which was extremely exciting. I covered the Falklands War, um, which again was very exciting. I, uh, while I was at um, 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 while I was at um, uh, the BBC, I, I'm going to pause now just to make um, a comment, and we'll go back to the choreography in a minute. The, I got embroiled in a major row between the BBC and Panorama. Um, we uh, were sued by two uh, members of Parliament um, who claimed that um, we had libelled them. The programme was about infiltration, in that case right-wing infiltration. Um, we'd made similar ones with left-wing infiltration in the Labour Party. Maggie's militant tendency, many people claimed, was anti-Thatcher. It was not. Um, it was not anti-Margaret Thatcher at all. What it was was it was about a Conservative Party report identifying extremist infiltration on the edges of the Conservative Party. We were interested in the process and to throw down to the Conservative Party the question, do you want these kind of people in your party, yes or no? If you say yes, well, we all know where we stand. If you say no, you'd expect them to do something about it. Um, I believe they did. Um, but my major point is this. It was not um, uh, an attack on Margaret Thatcher. I have a very high regard for Margaret Thatcher. I always have done. And it was about the very subject that they themselves um, looked into, which was r racist, anti-Semitic, right-wing extremism trying to infiltrate and, and having some success in the Conservative Party. And it was a very hard time, very, very difficult. Um, we were kind of lambasted from all sides. However, I think the programme has more than um, passed the test of time. Um, and uh, but there, we leave that there. Shortly um, before we were due to appear in court, um, to defend ourselves um, about an alleged libel. Um, uh, 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 the um, Brighton bomb went off. <clears throat> As uh, somebody who specialised in news and current affairs and throughout my entire time at the BBC was responsible for the coverage of BBC news and current affairs, I was in charge of um, the, um, the outside broadcast unit 
in Brighton, the night of the bomb. Um, in fact, I put my head on my pillow at 2.54, um, sorry, at 2.30, and the bomb went off at 2.54. Um, I uh, continue to broadcast for something like 24 hours. Um, I had the head of uh, British intelligence telling me, you must evacuate now. Um, uh, uh, now it's safe to have them back again. Then again, take them out, James, is an audience and so on, and the cabinet up there. Take them out, get out of them. Um, and so it went on. And I remember when I came home, which doesn't sound too pompous, I remember being, feeling as I've been raped because um, it's so, it was so violent. Uh, the IRA had put a huge bomb behind the panel in the bath room um, uh, uh, near Thatcher. So anyway, um, that was that. I then had um, an extraordinary time. Um, again, I had become um, an editor of Question Time the BBC's most prized um, piece of treasure where news and current affairs is concerned. Um, and um, in this period that I um, what was on it, um, we had a number of things. There was the hangover from the, the miners' strike, uh, which I had um, uh, covered extensively. Um, but also, um, uh, by this time, much more uh, of a problem to government was the poll tax. Under the poll tax, or council tax, um, as Mrs. Thatcher would prefer that we called it, under the um, poll tax, it brought in um, 36 million people into paying for the council tax, um, who, who had never had to pay before. So it was, it was a, I'm going to do that again because I'm not sure about the, this is the 36 pig. <coughs> TV. You must allow me to do that. All right, we'll go back to we'll go back to the Brighton bomb, okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, while the Brighton bomb was un uh, um, unraveling, I was informed by um, uh, the uh, people who had been working on our defence for Maggie Smith and Tenzi that there had been approaches from the other side, and that they were confident that there would be a settlement. So I left. Brighton and the Brighton bomb behind me, um, believing that we'd won a famous victory. And then, almost without warning, they told us, you've got to go to court. Um, and um, so we went to court, and two days into the trial, the government, the, the, um, uh, the BBC settled, and we were left out in the cold. Um, the, uh, I might say one more thing about the uh, miners' strike. The miners' strike ran throughout um, the, um, the 1980s, where British politics was concerned. It was very brutal, it was very savage, and it was like a fight to the death. Um, and um, its biggest mistake that Mrs. Thatcher made was point one, she didn't have a majority in her cabinet for taking on the miners, not at all. Um, the, um, and also, the introduction of the poll tax, um, which was going to bring in, to, into paying for local council tax, literally millions of people um, who had never paid tax uh, or like that in their lives and had no intention of doing so now. So on top of, um, the intense battles that Margaret Thatcher had fought uh, against the IRA, um, for example, uh, she suddenly found herself out on the streets again, having to fight off um, people who simply didn't want to pay poll tax and said it was grossly unfair, they never had to pay it before, etc, etc. She made a fatal mistake in her cabinet at that point no one supported her, to the best of my knowledge, except for one person. That person um, was um, uh, Nicholas Ridley, who had become Environment Secretary. And she gave him the job of bringing in 
um, this new tax. Fatal error. In British government, you don't do that. The Treasury treasures its role and responsibility and power over bringing in um, a, a new tax. So she went to war, if you like, with um, the uh, no, no support in her cabinet um, and very rocked by it. She was then, she was then challenged by Michael Heseltine, I covered this, uh, Michael Heseltine, uh, to become the new leader. She, it's uh, an interesting thing to reflect upon, the choreography of the fall of Margaret Thatcher. She um, was always a high-rise, high-risk uh, leader. She wasn't a Tory at all, in my view. She was a radical. Um, but so long as she kept winning, although they didn't like her on the whole, they kept on supporting her. But as she went through uh, the late 80s, her position was becoming more and more tenuous and exhausted. She was exhausted. The person who thought that he could defeat her was Michael Heseltine, who had himself um, served in uh, Margaret Thatcher's um, uh, cabinet, um, had held uh, cabinet posts, um, and um, who thought the time had come, because of poll tax, that he could get rid of her. Um, in fact, what happened is that then triggered uh, a Tory leadership election. And we covered, and I covered, um, the night of um, Margaret Thatcher's... Um, uh, the, the, Margaret, 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 the, she had gone, instead of going... Um, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'll start again. Just say, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So what happens is, is that Margaret Thatcher, um, with poll tax, an enormous um, weakening of her power, um, was was found herself being openly challenged, and uh, in the newspapers and so on, and at last someone dared to stand up against her and run against her, and that person was. Michael Heseltine, uh, who had been um, a leading member of Mrs. Thatcher's cabinet. Thatcher flew to um, Paris. She'd been told by her aides that she would win the ballot. She, what happens is, is that she's at the British Embassy and the result comes through. She did win the first ballot, but by but only a by a small margin. She knew that the small margin meant that she was finished. I spoke to Bernard Ingham, her press secretary, who she trusted a great deal. I said, why, why didn't Margaret Thatcher behave as Margaret Thatcher normally would? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, it seems to me that all her fight had gone out of her that night. And he said, Yes, you're absolutely right. It had. And I said exhaustion. He said total exhaustion. We stood together in a little group and no one spoke and no one knew what they were going to do. They kept looking at Thatcher to see if she would give them, as she normally would, their command. She was mummy. She would tell them what to do. On this night, mummy was silent. Mummy stays in Paris overnight. Very big mistake. She's still leader. She still won the first ballot. But what she should have done, she should have gone straight. And the normal, the normal Mrs. Thatcher, um, she would normally have gone straight to the House of Commons. She would have gone to her room and she'd have called them in one by one and said, what's your problem? Here's a knighthood. Now get out. And, and, and so on and so forth. But she didn't do that. And Ken Clark, actually said to her, I want to see you, Margaret. And Clark um, said to her, Margaret, the game is up. You've got to go. And she said, OK. And that was um, the end of her. I covered all of that period and all of those happenings very closely. Um, I covered the general election of 1979, 1983, 1987, 
um, and through till the early 90s. Um, we had um, a, two or three uh, interviews really stick in my mind. Uh, one was the night of the, um, uh, of the bombing uh, in Baghdad um, and seeing this CNN reporter put a gas mask on. Um, and we were frightened. We were absolutely frightened. Um, everyone scuds missiles, that was the phrase everybody used. We did, I think, um, two or three interviews that I'm certainly very proud of, and I think anyone would be. And these were the interviews in the run-up to the end of Margaret Thatcher. One where Nigel Lawson, once her great friend, had completely fallen out with her. He was Chancellor and um, he uh, was pro-European. <clears throat> and he, um, uh, okay, um, when I, around the time that I was editor of Question Time, um, I did a major interview with Nigel Lawson, which was riveting. It was an hour. And he hated Thatcher with a vengeance. And they'd fallen out massively, having once been friends, massively over the subject of Europe and European currency control. It was an electric interview. It was followed um, as well um, by um, the night of the fall of Margaret Thatcher. And we had through the studio, we had former Prime Ministers, we had Jim Callaghan, we had people like um, Enoch Powell, um, who Mrs Thatcher was a great admirer of, um, who gave the whole thing a sense of history. Um, but it was quite evident in those last two years that Mrs Thatcher had lost quite a lot of the, um, the passion and the stamina and the energy that she had at the beginning. Um, for all that, she is without question uh, one of the greatest Prime Ministers of the 20th century, in my view, um, and uh, box office. You have to have that. Um, now let me pick up on um, uh, some questions about the veracity and authority of what the BBC says. Um, and let me first of all say, everyone makes mistakes. Anyone who tells you don't mistake are the most frightening people of all. Um, does the BBC put out wrong information? Yes, it does. And um, we can give you, I think, two uh, very um, uh, obvious examples. Um, one is um, the investigation into the behaviour of the BBC around uh, their dealings with Princess Diana, cul culminating in her death, were shocking. The... Um, uh, the reporter, Martin Bashir, there was an investigation after years and years and years of the BBC standing by their Diana interview. Um, it's the interview, remember, where she said there were three of us in this marriage, um, which was a bit crowded. Obviously, the other person was Camilla. The BBC made that programme 25 years ago. The BBC, everyone uh, gave it enormous praise and credit. It was a TV event and the BBC lived off it for a long time. But about six months ago there was an investigation into exactly how the BBC got this interview out of which there were then absolutely devastating findings. It was found in the inquiry um, that, by the way, Earl Spencer deserves great credit for pushing. It was found that the BBC, the BBC had forged documents in order to persuade Diana, who was already in a very fragile state, that all her phones were being bugged, that the security services were trying to kill her, and so on. Completely turned her mind. Now, to say that they used forged documents would be bad enough. 
But they themselves created the forged documents. And they knew it. Throughout the 25 years since Diana's death, they have repeatedly said that it was a very fine place of work and it was, you know, it was a mastery of journalism and so on. That all collapsed six months ago when it turned out that the BBC had commissioned from a graphics artist deliberately falsified bank statements and the like uh, in order to persuade Diana that she was in great danger and that she should give this interview um, attacking Camilla and Charles in order to protect herself because once it was out in the public domain they would have, um, uh, they would have lost uh, in their attempt to uh, get rid of her and, they, uh, and she'd be safer. Now it turns out, when I say the BBC forged it, which is I think the most shocking part of it, um, the, um, how it came about that it was found out was, it was Bashir is the one who commissioned, he was a reporter on Panorama, he was, he was commissioned by the BBC, it, well, by Bashir, who was uh, employed by the BBC, to falsify um, documents relating to Diana's personal affairs, her finances and so on, in order to persuade her that she was in real risk, in danger of her life, and that she ought to go public sooner rather than later, before they knocked her off. Up for, up for, for 25 years the BBC denied this. But the BBC knew that Bashir had um, mocked up forged documents. He was a graphics artist for the BBC. Anyway, he mocked up these documents. He didn't know what they were for. He was just a graphics artist. In fact, they were the forged documents um, that were presented to Diana and I think Earl Spencer uh, in order to persuade them that there was something very seriously wrong and they needed protection. It is only as a result of um, an inquiry 25 years later that the BBC have apologised. The BBC have admitted that it was a major um, miscarriage of justice um, and um, forgery. That's what I want to say about it. Okay, so um, wrong information, forgery, it is a matter of record that the BBC have been guilty of that in the past. I'm not saying on a, on a grand scale at all. I have no idea. I certainly never did. But anyway, it was certainly in that case a second um, case, hard on the heels of the Diana interview, was um, a, um, an appalling lapse of journalistic standards when the BBC accused a dying man, Lord, Alpine, Lord McAlpine, um, of being a paedophile. He wasn't. Now, if you say to me, was that done knowingly, I would say no. I would say it was an issue of competence. They didn't even show, apparently. Um, the BBC was looking into allegations of a paedophile ring in Westminster. When they, um, into, when they researched Lord McAlpine, they didn't even show the person who um, they were they're accusing of being a paedophile, they didn't even show those pictures to his accusers. So the situation in which you say, Lord McAlpine is a paedophile and, uh, and, and he attacked you. And they said, well, can you show me the picture? No. Can you tell me where you got this information from? No. Um, Ultimately, was it a paedophile? No. But to not... Can you imagine in a detective story when they're looking on ID and they say, have you seen this gentleman? That didn't happen. But what they did, I think to curry favour um, um, with um, 
uh, certain people, um, they, um, they accused him. Sadly, the man died very soon afterwards. But it was just complete false. I don't know how it came about. Um, all I know is it was wrong information. And point two, they never tested it. They wanted to believe it. So I think that's um, the problem there. Um,